Larry Wiener. Larry is the principal of Larry Wiener Designs. He is probably the foremost expert on native meadows, their installation, their maintenance, and their role in our landscapes in the United States. So we are very pleased to have him here today. His firm is located just outside of Philadelphia. So Larry's going to talk to us, and then we'll have uh, some Q&A follow-up then. Larry. Thank you very much, Chris, and it's a, a, a pleasure to be here. Um, this is the first time, no, it's not actually, I spoke to a chapter of Beekeepers, uh, uh, but never a full, full state meeting. Um, uh, we better? There we go. I guess I need to keep my hand off of this. Um, so the bad news is, uh, I am not knowledgeable about bees, um, but the good news is I'm knowledgeable about something that uh, enhances the habitat and, uh, uh, and your ability to, to successfully raise bees, in this case wildflower meadows, and native landscape design in general. Um, so the reason I titled this Wildflower Meadows Let's Get Real is because so many attempts to create wildflower meadows are just not based on reality. Um, really what needs to be understood here, which is true with the ability to manipulate or enhance or uh, create uh, any kind of complex native landscape is, it's not a horticultural, uh, it's part horticulture, part agriculture, but part science. And the science part of it gets left out. There are reasons why certain things grow out in an open field landscape, which is what we're talking about when we talk about a meadow. There are reasons why this field is dominated by that group of species, and that field is dominated by a different group of species, and over there it's a whole different group of plants, even though they're all open sunny landscapes uh, in the same region. Um, so if we don't understand why things are happening in nature out in this kind of landscape, it makes it very difficult for us to be able to uh, uh, be able to steer these landscapes in the direction we want, in this case, a diverse native wildflower meadow, which is, in, by and large, what I'll be talking about, but I'm also going to kind of contrast it with uh, actually what is mostly out in the field. So let's kind of get into it here. Um, there's no significance to the cemetery aspect of this picture. Um, uh, the reason I showed it, uh, is because there's a, a plant in this meadow. This is a, a, some, a part of some work we did at Mount Auburn Cemetery uh, in, uh, uh, just outside of, well, in, in uh, Waterbury, Cambridge, uh, just outside of Boston. And uh, these folks, unlike most cemeteries, which just mow lawn around the monuments and maybe there's a few rough areas here and there, are very interested in habitat. Both pollinators, amphibians, and other forms of, of uh, habitat enhancement and creation. And so, where they are able, uh, we've been uh, helping them put together uh, meadows and other types of landscapes. Um, but the reason I, I picked this is you're looking uh, across uh, some various composite flowers, aster species, and goldenrod species. And this is uh, an upland form of New York, of ironweed, not. All right, it's on. Maybe we're teetering on a battery or something, I'm not sure. Um, and the reason I'm showing this plant, that's a view of Boston from the, that hilltop where that meadow is, um, is in this case, given we're, you're just getting started here, wait, want to address that. Um, at any rate, you can see the honeybee population uh, on that plant. And about meadows, obviously plant diversity is key. Um, think different plants that are uh, uh, providing uh, food source for, uh, uh, for pollinators and bees, uh, many different, more different species can have the better. But what's interesting about meadows in particular is while there are many open fields, uh, 
How's that? Good? All right. Nothing but smooth sailing here so far. All right, I guess I will leave that out. Kind of put it out of the way. At any rate, uh, the interesting thing about meadows and their relationship to diversity of plant species available to bees uh, is that while there are, uh, you, you drive around all of New, you know, much of New Jersey and you'll see open fields. Um, but what is not, the plant communities that are dominating those open fields are in almost all cases European grasses and forage pasture that have remained the dominant species in our field. Um, and the plants, and many of the European plants that came over with them. And native meadow species uh, are the least uh, abundant plants in general uh, in, in terms of uh, uh, diversity of species. They really are not found in the European uh, grass dominated fields. So these are things that, while they are native to this region, actually need to be planted and managed in order to have them. And when they occur naturally, um, in most cases, it's usually interestingly in extreme cases where it's very wet or extremely dry, and where you have uh, more mesic conditions, where you have richer soils, and, uh, more, uh, uh, rich and uh, uh, more horticulturally, so to speak, desirable uh, moisture retention, that's when you have mostly European grasses and the, plant, the European plants that are commonly associated with them. Um, so the diversity of these species is going to be uh, uh, certainly enhanced by the diversity of plants that you have out there. Understanding that most of what you're working with uh, are European honeybees. But these are just some images and I can't uh, identify them for you, but some images of different bees. Now, what you're looking here at here is basically replacement for a front lawn, um, and the plant that you're seeing dominating at this point in time uh, is mountain mint, uh, and this is one of the really great species for bees. All the plants in the mint family, which is pick man from them, is the genus name. Uh, there are a number of different ones. Some that grow in wetter fields, some that grow in drier fields, some that grow in dry woods. Um, but the mint family uh, is really a key species. And the good news about the mint family is there are a lot of very easy to grow, competitive plants uh, that can persist over time in these meadows. So here's just a uh, before picture of uh, turf. There's that hillside. Afterwards, again, you're seeing mountain mint uh, and little blue stem. Uh, is the dominant grass in there, which is an example of a native grass that you can find in uh, uh, open fields but it's generally, it may not be there at all, or it's generally uh, one of the recessive species, uh, not dominant. Uh, and as you travel the path, that's a closer look at the mountain and a little blue stem. There are other things in there, but this is what is most prominent that time of year. Um, and the red flower on the left is another plant in the, in the mint family uh, called bee balm. Uh, this grows in moist woodland edges. And, uh, terrific pollinator plant, and then of course uh, uh, any of the paintbrush uh, is a plant on the right. Perfect cone flower. And one of the reasons I wanted to show this uh, is, you know, I'm going to talk about how to establish these things, how to manage them. And I've already talked a little bit about, you know, the, the fact that you're providing plants that are not out in nature very much at all, and increasing the diversity. But it's not just about the plants, whether you have included this plant. It's also about the square footage, so to speak. In other words, sometimes, uh, you hear a lot now about planting pollinator plants. That's a, it's a huge topic in the horticulture world. Um, but in a way, if you're planting a pollinator garden, I kind of feel like the landscape isn't doing the job it should. Because a landscape should be uh, uh, Ecologic and ecologically functioning entity. And yes, there's lawn, and yes, there's other things that don't have much to do with the ecology of it, that have to do with the functionality of the site. But the point is, what we do is, we kind of do a few plantings here and there, and then uh, 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 leave the rest of the lawn 
Not because we necessarily need that much lawn, but we just don't know what else to do with it. And so the idea here is figure out how much lawn do you need for what you use, and then consider other types of vegetation, which are going to, if these are native uh, uh, plants in the sun, they're going to be native meadow species, and they're going to be hugely beneficial for bees and other pollinators. So the idea here is not just have a pollinator garden, but to have the landscape be significantly colonized by pollinator plants. And this is when I said, you know, let's get real. This is kind of the unreal version. Um, you know, many of you, how many of you have uh, planted a meadow? Not too many. Okay. How many that have planted a meadow still have one that they consider viable after three years? A oh. Yeah. Uh, it, the products that are out there, the protocols, that are commonly uh, uh, made available in the traditional kind of horticultural world is more along the lines of this, although that is changing, uh, uh, gratefully. Uh, and this is something that is dominated by annual plants. They're not competitive. They don't compete the weeds out. They're not long-lived. And they're wonderful things for a year to a uh, And then they basically yield to the weeds. We're not talking about that. We're talking about native species that are selected for their adaptability to the specific site that you are working with, uh, and they have the ability to regenerate for many years to come. Uh, but picking the plants is hugely important, but it's not the end of the story. Here's a picture of, uh, I don't know who, who did this. This is just a place I was traveling through. But folks planted a garden. Uh, these are viable native species, including one of the mountain nymphs in there, a bee bomb, another one in the mint uh, family, black eyed sumi, a joe pieweed, golden rod. This actually is a really uh, highly beneficial uh, pollinator species. But what that meadow is, is a field of mugwort, which is a nasty, nasty weed. And you don't find any of those in there. The point being, they picked the right plants, but they didn't understand the ecological processes that govern plants in an open field. And the weeds just took over. They didn't look at this situation and say, first of all, what are the plants that will grow here? And these may very well be the plants that will grow there. And then the second question is, what's likely to unfold here along with these plants? And if someone would have looked at that field analytically, they certainly would have known there was mugwort there. They would have known how aggressive that weed is. And they would have known they needed to do something about it before they started planting a meadow where no matter how well they selected the species, they weren't going to end up with a meadow for very long, at least with the plants that they found. So there's two things, the plants and the processes. So I'm going to talk about that. So here's part of a 40-acre uh, planted meadow from a seed in uh, uh, northwest Connecticut, in Salisbury, Connecticut. And um, if you look out, you're looking out at the uh, Litchfield Hills, and it's about 40 acres. Now, when we plant, a pollinator garden. We go out and we buy plants and we plant them in the garden and we weed everything in between. Now, I don't think anybody's interested in buying enough plants, uh, enough potted perennials to fill 40 acres, nor is anyone interested in hand weeding 40 acres. So the point here is we can't look at this planting as a garden because it's way beyond garden scale and the things we do to control a garden we can't do. So what we have to do is have a deeper understanding of ecological process, apply gross things, not individual weeding, but time mowing or selective height mowing, things that will push the vegetative composition in the direction we want, which are the planted species, and against the ones we don't want, which are weeds, and I'll talk about some specific ways to do that. And then uh, view a statement later in the summer when the native grass, and uh, Indian grass, is starting to go uh, to seed. Uh, but you may say, I don't have 40 acres, so why do I need to uh, understand uh, uh, field ecology uh, enough to be able to be successful in 40 acres? But if you think about it, this is uh, uh, a development uh, in North Jersey, um, not that far from here, actually. And these are small properties. And here's a before picture of the lawn, and there's the after with the meadow there. The point being, that whole property isn't an acre. So I would say this whole meadow is maybe 15, 20% of an acre, if that. So that's a small meadow. I don't need to know how to do this stuff. Yes, you do. A small meadow, a big garden. That's a huge garden. 
and you don't want to buy potted plants and fill it up, and you don't want to weed it by hand either. So even if you're dealing with smaller spaces in this kind of um, uh, landscape situation, you've got to start understanding the topology of applying. So I'll split it up to three things, designing, a seed mix, uh, uh, planting, and management. So the first is site analysis, and this is a, a very big one, and this is a, a concept. What you're going to find here as I go through this, that a lot of things that you may have learned in horticulture is the right thing to do is actually counterproductive in this kind of situation. And this is a good example to start with. Site analysis, match the plant to the site, not the site to the plant. So you need to very carefully look at the soil type, the hydrology, the moisture levels, um, the sunshade patterns, north facing slopes versus south facing slopes, flatland versus slope. You need to really pinpoint what kind of habitat you have and pick the plants that are adapted to that habitat. Now you can say, uh, uh, why is this any different than in horticulture? And the word is competition. If you take a plant that is outside of where it normally grows, where it naturally recruits in nature, you put it in a garden, and it's not quite the right soil, and it's not quite the right sunlight, but it's a garden, and you're weeding around it, and it doesn't have to compete with other plants, and maybe it's getting watered once in a while, maybe it's getting fertilized, but even if it isn't, it lacks the competition that happens in nature. And that means it's operating more efficiently than normal. All the sunlight that comes to that spot, it gets. It's not intermingled with seven other plants that are all fighting for the same sunlight. So it's operating very efficiently and hence may be able to survive and even grow well outside of its natural habitat. But if you take a plant and put it out there in the meadow, now there may be six or seven plants in a square foot all intermingled and it's not operating as efficiently because it has to compete. And consequently, in the same soil and the same hydrological conditions, a plant may do well without competition and it may completely drop out in competition. So the point here is once you get into these intermingled competitive landscapes, which you need in this kind of scale, then you have to be a, have a higher level of plant selection in terms of matching the plant to the habitat where it grows, so to speak. It's not just kind of, you're gonna, in all likelihood, if you're picking plants for a meadow, you're going to uh, concentrate on species uh, uh, that are favoring the bees. But what you also need to do is concentrate on the species that are favoring the bees that are adapted to the site that you're putting them. I mentioned mountain mint as a really great plant. Well, there are mountain mints that grow on wetlands. There are mountain mints that grow on dry slopes. I mentioned mountain mints that grow in woods. There are mints that grow on woodland edges. Which one do you got? Well, the more habitat types you have, the more you have the ability to use different plants and get different diversity. But because a plant's great for bees and you put it out there, you haven't done anything for bees if that plant won't grow. So the point I'm making here is, uh, uh, the secondary point is, look at the soil conditions you have and pick the plants that are adapted to that condition, which is the opposite of horticulture. Horticulture goes in and says, if I have a dry, gravelly, sandy, or sandy soil, if I have a poorly drained clay soil, if I have a low spot that's not draining well, I'm going to do something about it. I'm going to make it better horticulturally. Now, what the advantage of making it better horticulturally is you can grow more plants. Because most everything will grow in a nice, loamy soil if you bring in topsoil, you can dig in compost and all that. But also, every weed will grow in it. The richer and better you make the soil, the more hospitable you make it for weeds. And there are a ton of very aggressive weeds out there that can shut down the meadow planting. So when you have a very dry condition, which this is, that mountain mint is uh, upland mountain mint and little blue stems and grasses in there and there's other things, but that's what you see now again. Those plants tolerate extremely dry situations. So if you put them there, they're fine. They don't need the compost, they don't need the topsoil, they don't need the fertilizer. All you're doing by putting this compost, topsoil, and fertilizer in is allowing the weeds to be more aggressive. That's the same thing with the wet area. So the idea here is don't make the soil great for everything. Look at the soil composition type and pick the plants that are adapted to it. And don't start bringing stuff in. Weeds are your biggest problem. There are so many weeds there, so aggressive out there, that's your problem. Once you plant them, it's all, once you plant the plants, it's the right species, it's all about 
that early stage management to favor what you planted over the leaves that are waiting in the wind. Um, so you look at these plants, you know, that looks like a pretty healthy composition. It's in a terrible soil, and a good horticulturist would have made the soil better. And if the horticulturist did that, this meadow would have been much harder to manage and would have been uh, as pure. This is the opposite extreme. This is a very wet meadow. And you're looking at pink milkweed uh, as the dominant species out there. You could have drained it. You could have put something in the soil to uh, make it more, uh, to increase the drainage. You could have put pipes in there to take the water away. There's no need to put the plants that will grow there and plant it. And you can see in the bottom right corner, it looks like a different composition. There's a bee balm with uh, lavender flower and uh, uh, oxide sunflower, the yellow flower. That's supposed that's up on the rise. It's on a little slope that comes out at, comes out of the wet meadow. It's a different species were planted there than out of the wet. So here's out in the wet meadow, and here's another one in the mountain inch that I, I uh, tried to include quite a few of because it's such a good genus. This is one called Pignanthalum muticum, and it also grows in moist uh, to mesic, meaning uh, between dry and wet. That's the meadow. And we're looking at uh, uh, still this, that same wet meadow and the diversity that's in there. Uh, the same mountain mint on the bottom, and pink milkweed, a couple of goldenrod species, big blue stem, one of the native grasses on the left. So pine weed, a tremendous pollinator plant, and monkey flower. Uh, high diversity in here. This is really a diverse meadow, and the weed pressure is very low. And one of the reasons you can achieve that level of diversity and that ease of maintenance is because the drainage is bad and it's too wet. Too wet for a horticulture, it's but perfect for that. And this is just an example of, I'm talking about matching the plant to the place. And you could say, well, you know, any good plant person does that. You know, it's sunny, I'm not gonna plant a plant that loves the shade. If it's real wet, I'm not gonna plant a plant that likes it dry. But I'm talking about a deeper level. I want to use this plant, a deeper level of analysis in that regard. And I want to use this plant, Rexia, to illustrate that. Um, this is a plant that grows in wet meadow. So the meadow is defined in part by sun. And we're talking about a wet meadow. So you could assume if I have an open sunny spot that tends to be wet, this is a good plant for me. Um, and it is a really nice plant. It was late year, uh, uh, good plant. However, Rexia grows in coastal plain wet meadow. A coastal plain wet meadow uh, is generally a very well-drained sandy soil and is wet because of the high water table. Whereas if you go in inland, let's say in the Ridge Valley in New Jersey, a wet meadow may be a heavy soil that is wet because it's a low-lying spot in the topography and the soil is drained. Those are not the same thing. And they're both wet meadows, but they're not the same species. There are different conditions. And so Rexia is going to grow in the coastal plain wet meadow and going to be a successful plant in the ridge and valley wet meadow. So what I'm talking about here is looking up the eco region within that you are in, figuring out the habitat type, meaning the physical characteristics, the soil, the hydrology. And then this is stuff you can look up online or in books. Uh, ecological communities of New Jersey is a reference you can use that has plants grouped in community in different, uh, it identifies the ecoregion of the state and it identifies the species that grow in those ecoregions within different habitat types. And it's the basis for a plant list um, and the basis for you to kind of figure out where you are and where the plants are most appropriate for you. Um, and this idea of uh, uh, a plant uh, in this kind of condition, in a meadow putting out by seed, uh, you know, when you plant trees, you plant 12 trees, you expect to come back and see 12 trees. Uh, when you plant a seeded meadow, you can't ask me, okay, how many plants do you expect to be out there? Well, 12 million, 700,000, you know, you know, it's not like that. We're putting seeds out, and we want two things to happen. We want as many of those seeds to germinate and become living plants as possible. And the second thing is, we want as many as the, of those plants as possible to spread their seed and proliferate further. So that as, in as short a period of time as possible, the species we planted are dense cover and smothering out most of the invading weeds. So how, how does that happen? Matching the habitat to the plant more religiously allows that to happen in terms of a plant not only surviving but proliferating. 
it will proliferate, you'll be more likely to proliferate if it is in the habitat from which it uh, uh, normally grows. And here's an example. This is an Indian paintbrush again. And uh, this plant uh, really is ubiquitous in the southwest. And it's, but it is also native in New Jersey and Pennsylvania and New England. New York. Except uh, in the southwest, it grows all over the place. When you go there in February, March, you might see fields full of it. Here, it's uncommon, and it only grows in certain places. And that's because it's a plant that requires high pH soils derived from limestone. And that's what they have mostly in the southwest. And we only have it in selected places, veins of limestone. That's where this plant will grow. And you can look at a geological map and see that you are on that vein of limestone or not. And if you are, this is a great plant for you. And if it isn't, it's not. And in this case, here it is coming up. These were planted just in patches, not in the whole meadow. It's coming up in seed, and you're just seeing a few scattered plants. And now over time, that patch is filling in. And now over more time, Um, you know, we will pull some other things in. But the core of it 
is basically plants that are adapted to the situation you have or actually native to the situation you have. All right, we're back on track, thank you, appreciate it. So the idea of individual species selection, but when I say the plant communities of New Jersey is a good reference, one of the reasons it's a good reference is it's not just a list of the plants in New Jersey and how to identify them, it's grouping them according to communities. So you're not listing a bunch of individuals in the way you're taking a whole community of plants and putting them in that field. Um, and here you can see a community, and a community of, again, mountain men, uh, Leatrice or a uh, blazing star, and you can see a butterfly on one of them, that's another great pollinator plant, and big blue stem and ball grass. Now, from a management standpoint, this idea of putting a community of plants out there, whether it's a meadow or a wood or anything else, has great practical ramifications because, first of all, these plants are thriving because they uh, are adapted to where they are, have been placed, number one. Number two, they are very densely intermingled but in a pretty balanced appearing uh, fashion. In other words, if you looked at that plant composition and uh, took a square foot, you might find five or six plants in a square foot. That seems crazy, that seems overgrown. But you've got three plants here. You've got a mountain mint, which is a, a, a low creeping thing. And then you've got a uh, blazing star, which is very tall and upright. that goes through it, the flowers up above it form C. And then you have big blue stem, which hasn't finished growing at this point in the season, and that's going to canopy over top of all of it, like almost like a canopy tree. So you have three layers of plants. They are occupying the same place, but they are have reduced the competition between each other because they're operating at different levels. And what that means from a practical standpoint is, if I'm a weed seed that drops in the middle of that, I got to get through the mountain mint layer, then I got to get through the leaf trees, and then I got to get through the big blue stem. And on the root systems underground, there's layers also. I got to find space for my roots to get going. There's very little seed germination. And when you get to this stage, whether it's a wet meadow or a dry meadow, when you get this kind of domination of the species you planted, the management of it, the weed incursion, is minimal. There's always something. Nothing is ever no management, but it becomes very, very easy. And this is really important. I've already kind of referred to this. How much time do I have for a second? Let me make sure I'm um, This is really important. I started off talking about most of the fields that we have here are European grass dominated and the European flowers that are mostly associated with them. And then there's native dominated meadows, which are the minority of what you see, but what, the majority of what I plant um, when I'm doing it. So here's a cool. Let's look at cool and warm season grass meadows. So first of all, let me define the difference between, the general difference between cool season, uh, between European uh, pasture grasses and native grasses. There's two major characteristics that they differ and they're important to understand. Often they're referred to, the native grasses are all often referred to as warm season plum forming grasses. And the pasture grasses from Europe are often referred to as cool season mat forming grasses. So then most of the native grasses do not grow in the spring. They're warm seasons. They emerge when, when the weather gets warm in the onset of summer, and they're inactive in the spring. The European grasses are cool season grasses. They are most active growing in the spring. And then in the hot summer, they go dormant. And lawn grass and turf, turf grass is also of that category. And that's why they don't like the heat. They don't like the drought. And so if a cool season grass field is left up in the summer, it'll turn brown, and then it'll start to kind of flop. Um, and that's, uh, 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 unless it's low and in June, and then you don't have that happening, so you only see the field doing that. A warm season grass field isn't even present in the spring from a foliar standpoint, and it tolerates the heat beautifully and goes through the summer, fall, and actually stands in the winter. Now, the other cat, different category, so warm season native, cool season European, uh, is clump versus mat. Native grasses are mostly clump forming, they just come up in a clump, and most of the European pasture grasses and turf grasses are mat forming. They run by rhizomes. Those differences are very important in terms of what they'll grow in. A mat forming grass is a basically colonizing the entire upper strata of the soil. There's very little room for other root systems there, either to penetrate through it or to coexist with it on the surface. Interestingly, the flowers that you find in the cool season grass fields that are European grasses are mostly the ones that just 
naturally recruit are mostly European flowers. And upon further uh, study of those that I did, I found that most of those flowers are taproot. And that makes sense. If you're going to have to coexist with a dense, mat forming surface rooted plant, you're tap rooted, you're down below it, and you're fine. You got plenty of open space to draw uh, uh, soil uh, to draw water and nutrients from. So many of the species that are native, or almost all of the species that are native uh, here, don't occur in those fields. They may be around, but they just don't seed in with any regularity. Uh, there's one exception that you do find in cool season uh, European grass fields. A native plant, that's butterfly weed, the orange butterfly weed. You'll find that in cool season grass fields. Not big patches, but individual plant. Guess what? It's taproot. So if you're using warm season native grasses, they're plum forming, and there's spaces between those plums, meaning it's kind of uh, uh, engineered or has evolved into a coexistence of a lot of different species because it's not forming this dominating mat at the surface. So if you want a diversity of native species, you should plant them with the native grasses. And if you would rather have European species, and clover would be one of those, uh, then you're better off using European uh, cool season grasses and things like clover and eggs and those kinds of European uh, flowers are the ones that will be in them. And maybe you have a field of both. Clover is certainly a good plant for bees. It's something in a native meadow I don't like because it's not doesn't coexist well with it. It coexists well with the European meadow that it evolved with. So, and I'm not making uh, value judgments here between the European meadow versus the native meadow. What I'm kind of saying is, as a beekeeper, if you want to increase, if you want to absolutely maximize the herbaceous uh, uh, sunlit uh, uh, or, uh, plant composition, the diversity of that composition, probably best to have a cool season field in the, in a, in a warm, a cool season European field and a warm season native field. Uh, to be honest with you, even though most of what I plant uh, is, is, is native, uh, but for your purposes, um, there may be both. <clears throat> but don't try to mix them. As soon as you, if the grass is the defining characteristic, you don't try to take the European plants and put them with the native American grasses or vice versa. And this is not a value judgment, it is just these are the plants that those plants evolve with, have formed uh, complementary uh, uh, relationships with both root systems and spatially above ground, and they work better. So here's cool season on the left in the summer, and warm season native on the right, and you can see the difference in the summer and the heat adaptability. If you were there in the spring, that cool season grass would be nice and green, and the warm season grass would be absent. It was growing in. And here again, classic plant that you see in pastures of European cool season grass, Queen Anne's lace, in the carrot family, taproot. One of the few that you find native, this is a native planted meadow, but I didn't have a, happen to have a picture of butterfly weed in a European grass meadow. But again, one of the few natives you find in cool season European grass meadows in the town. And you know, again, this, uh, this is a, a bit of a, uh, a little more of an esoteric concept, but I think important and very encouraging uh, for the future when you're planting these things. This is fringe gentian. And fringe gentian uh, is a uh, native meadow plant, very much a specialist, needs very specific conditions. And this is a meadow that I planted, uh, and I took this picture probably 15, 17, 16, 17 years after planting, and uh, except I did not plant that fringe gentian. The fringe gentian came in on its own about 15 years or so after I planted the meadow, and I never put that seed in. And that is a very specialist plant that requires very uh, specific soil conditions for it to germinate. There are generalists, just like bees, there are generalists and specialists. Um, well, this is a specialist plant. Why did it show up 15 years after I planted this meadow? And I didn't, again, I didn't put the seed in there. And my theory on this is that having restored that meadow to the native species, to the soil type that is there, and the chemical uh, uh, residue of the decomposition of the vegetation that is also historically was was historically associated with that soil is restoring those specialist conditions over time to the point where specialist plants that may still have a seed residue in the soil bank but were not germinating because the conditions were not right the conditions
conditions are now reverting back to closer to historic reported disturbance and all that. And this is theory. This is my theory of it. This is by no means an absolute, this is what happened here. Um, but the point is that when you put the plants and the soils back together over time, they are starting to restore the condition through the chemical decomposition of the species that were associated with that soil. And making things easier as time goes on for even the harder to grow species to start to come in like that. Microhabitats and patterns, I already alluded to this. In one field, there may be different habitat types. It's wet in the center, it's dry on the fringes, it's shadier on the edges of the woods. You're identifying these different zones and planting different things in those zones. And this is just a naturally occurring uh, coastal, uh, uh, Cape May area, uh, 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 coastal marsh. And you can see sedges in the middle, and then uh, hibiscus is the shrub layer, and then uh, bayberry and red cedar. It's all moisture. Wettest in the center, a little drier, then drier, reflects different plant compositions. If you went to that field and you were turning, this is a very wet area, you probably wouldn't be, well, you could be planting a wet meadow, absolutely you could be. Um, but if you planted all the same plants on the whole thing, the ones that were adapted to the specific hydrology of the spot would survive and the other ones would drop out. So you're looking at the field and looking at the different <coughs> uh, conditions and maybe getting different seed mixes or plant mixes. Here's a farm field. Uh, it's a really beautiful field, of course. Uh, I doubt, I find that very graceful composition. I doubt that the farmer put his field up on a drawing table and started trying to find graceful lines. What the farmer did was plant where the corn, where it was dry enough, well drained enough for it to grow, and didn't plant it in the where it was too wet, and consequently created quite a graceful aesthetic composition just by following the ecological conditions. Like here it is in a planted meadow. And you can see where the Coryopsis is flowering in the upland and where things are not blooming yet. Up, this is the spring, uh, is the wetter areas, and there were two completely different seasons. And here is how it played out uh, many years later, which brings me to another point, the meadow stage of succession. So you can see the microhabitat, the wet swale in the center, and uh, on either side there's more upland, so you can see they were planted with different species. But also, I wanted to look at succession, which is the uh, vegetative change over time. Now succession is commonly uh, understood in you know, the eastern United States to be if you let a field go, uh, if you ran a bulldozer over a field that was bare dirt, it would start off with herbaceous grasses and flowers, they would turn into uh, uh, shrubs and pioneer trees, which is kind of called the old field stage where they're all mixed, and then the pioneer trees would uh, cover it over and it would become uh, early stage forest and then the later stage of mature canopy trees, that's succession. Uh, field, the shrub thicket, pioneer trees, the forest. Um, but within the field part of it, within the meadow part of it, there's also a successional process. Uh, so let's look at that. Here's uh, a little patch of one before anything's happening. And here is the second year after planting. And here's the same spot you're looking under the pine. You can see the pine trunk. And here's the same spot probably two years later at the same time of year. So the point here is these are short-lived perennials or biennials that were the first things to come up and flower. And you can see uh, Ordium is the grass in the front, Black-Eyed Susan. But they're short-lived species. And if you walked into that and pulled the, that pulled aside and looked underneath, you would see smaller, slower-growing plants of that. And the short-lived species die, and these take over. And that's the way it works in nature. The long-lived species that would colonize a prairie for 100 years take a long time to get established. And the species that grow really quick and you see happen right away, like Black-Eyed Susan, are very short-lived. So you need both of those. That meadow and can that I showed you, it was all annuals that I said, you know, that you know, blows you away with flowers and then fades out. Well, that's stocked with fast-growing, short-lived things. That's why it fades out. <coughs> this has those short-lived things. But it also has the next stage in there. Now, if that's planted from seed, you're planting both of those species, all of those species at the same time, but they are unfolding at different rates. So you're kind of planting a relay. And you need that relay. Because as I said, the biggest problem once you plant it is to keep the weeds out. And the best way to keep the weeds out, there are things that you will need to do, and I'll get to that in a moment, to keep them out. But the majority of the weed suppression is done by the plants. 
And that means that at all times, there needs to be dense cover of stuff you want to suppress weed seed germination. So if you only plant long-lived species, which is the opposite of planting the metal and can thing, which is all short-lived, you've still made a mistake because they're slow growing and it's going to take a long time to de-weed suppress it because they're little seedlings for a couple few years before they can do anything. And if you don't have the short-lived species in there, you have no weed suppressant in the early stages and the weeds will outgrow the short-lived perennial species. So you're putting together a relay of plants that intermingle with nature in the same space but also occupy that space at different times, and you're planning for that in the seed creation. They're looking out the lake across that. And here's a plant, Culver's root, that from seed can take six, seven, eight years before you get a significant uh, flowering plant from it. Does that mean you gotta wait seven, eight years for your meadow to, to be good? No, because there were species in the second year, and some things that came in the third year, and some of them dropped out, some things in the fourth and the fifth, and those are probably long lived some that really take a long time, like cold tree. So here's a temporary meadow, because this is intended to be reforestation. And so when the trees are first planted, it's still sunny, because they're not big enough to create a shady situation. So the meadow seed mix here is composed of sun-loving early stage species and shade-loving later stage species. So instead of black-eyed Susan that you saw in that first picture, you still have black-eyed Susan here, because in the early stage it's sunny, and that's an early stage plant. But instead of the cone flower, which is a sun plant that will succeed too, you may be succeeding to a woodland mountain instead, because it's going to be a different condition when the trees uh, uh, are planted. Here's a little picture of the lawn and the trees, and there it is, um, early stage. Different type of reforestation where small trees with tree tubes, but it's the same concept. The idea here is that this is a meadow for quite a few years in this case because these trees are very small. Um, uh, there are species in there that will succeed into uh, shade tolerant species in this case. Um, uh, I just want to quickly illustrate this idea between soil fertility. Don't, your friend in the meadow is in there are species that are absolutely adapted to that situation, and it makes the weeds harder to work with. So here's uh, uh, a meadow planting and uh, uh, <coughs> illustrating. Uh, it's one of the most diverse large-scale plantings I've ever done, and the soil was gravelly junk from a horticultural standpoint. And you can see the intricacy of it. You know, cone flower, oxide sunflower, butterfly weed, little blue stem, uh, that scrap leg plant is uh, a rouse snake master. Uh, Penstemon with the flower, you can see some oak weed in front of the Penstemon in the paintbrush, hawk weed, Aptesia, Culver's root, uh, the white flower, uh, uh, Queen of the Prairie, the pink flower, um, uh, wild quinine, uh, Aptesia in fruit, uh, nodding onion, uh, daisy fleabane, that's a little blue stem in grass, uh, purple prairie clover, uh, again, uh, like sunflower and gray quinine. Three different species of blazing flower we'll look at, wet dry and an upland late one. Uh, some of the uh, goldenrods, upland ironweed, we're getting into the fall now. Uh, cup plant, and again, talking about uh, you know uh, insects in general, this is a plant uh, where if you look at the leaves, it forms a cup and after it rains, the water sits in the leaves. Uh, as you fly, it's come spring, the birds come and plants are starting to come in now that this habitat has been changed uh, more towards what it used to be by the vegetative composition <coughs> and root uh, systems, uh, the way the root systems interact with the soil, things that are native but weren't planted starting to come in, some of them rare like this one flower uh, cancer root which is actually a parasitic plant. And there's the uh, uh, gentian that I talked about before, this was the meadow that that's in. And there's a, anybody know what species it is? I don't know. Uh, but probably it could very well be a specialist because this is a very specialist plant. There you see the of that. This is in Allentown, Pennsylvania, and it's a successful meadow. It's been published and everything else. It's in a very rich floodplain soil, and I will never be able to get the diversity in this meadow that I got in the other meadow, no matter how hard I try, for two reasons. Because 
the plants that I put in there, because it's rich, those that are a little more competitive will outcompete the ones that are less competitive, and I will have less diversity, even if I put a lot of native diversity in there. And number two, because it's a rich soil, I can expect weeds to grow robustly, and it's in my interest to select very aggressive plants to be able to battle it out with them. And if I'm selecting aggressive plants that are adapted to that site, they're going to outcompete less aggressive ones, even that I might put in there, a native thing. So I kind of am tied to a higher aggressive uh, uh, plant selection, which lowers the diversity, and that's just the way it is. Except on a dry, gravelly, small slope uh, that was actually created along a little road that was up above that, um, I had a real dry, poor condition, and I was able to get more of the intricacy in this uh, because of the poor condition that I wouldn't have been able to get at the bottom of that slope or throughout the rest of that 30 plus acres. Installation. Don't till, do not till or plow. When you till or plow, when you turn the soil over, you're ruining the soil structure, number one. It's probably it may have already been ruined by years of cultivating and agriculture. But what you're doing, most importantly, is bringing up weed seeds that were too uh, deep to germinate but are still viable, bringing them to the surface, which is all roughed up in the perfect seed bed, and basically you're just begging for weeds. You put your seeds in there, and it's a crap shoot who is going to win. The better method is to do it with a, in the various ways, but no-till. And this is a no-till drill cedar that's specially adapted to very varied sizes of native meadow seeds and grasses. It presents different boxes that will accommodate different sizes. But basically the idea is um, it's just cutting furrows through the field and depositing seed in the furrows and not tilling up and not disturbing. The more you disturb, the more you get weed seed. You can see here it's cutting furrows through dead grass, and the grass is dead because it was sprayed uh, with herbicide, and not tilled under just seed uh, cut into it. Uh, different site, as you can see, this one was bare soil and not thatch, uh, but you can see how the seedlings are coming up in pretty much in rows uh, from that cedar. And what it means is disturbance generates uh, additional seed germination. Undisturbed soil will not have as much seed germination as disturbed soil. There will still be some, but the rate will be less. Now, when I've cut a furrow, I've disturbed the soil in, 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 only in the, at that furrow, and I've deposited seed in that furrow, and everything between the furrow has not been disturbed. Meaning that between the furrows, there will be a lower rate of seed germination, and in the furrow, there will be a higher rate, and I put the seeds in the furrow where the higher rate condition exists. So it's, again, one of the things you're doing to stack the deck in favor of the species you're planting. No one thing I tell you to do is going to make the whole thing work. The whole compendium does. Right plant in the right place. Minimize disturbance. Don't go tilling. Um, and I'll move on. First year after seeding, the meadow gets mowed. There is a nurse, always an annual nurse crop of grass. It might be uh, uh, oats. It might be annual rye. It might be winter wheat. But there's always an annual crop of grass that is planted with the meadow seed. And that's the first thing that comes up. And the first growing season, the meadow is mowed once every approximately six weeks at a high height of five or six inches. Why? No seedlings will be bigger than five or six inches the first year. The nurse crop grass could get waist high or more. So by cutting it above the seedlings, you're optimizing the light to those seedlings and making them establish more quickly and robustly. You are also, annual weeds are the first things that come in in profusion. And an annual weed is an annual, it's going to die over a winter. And if you're periodically mowing that field, those annual weeds are not going to seed. And they're uh, not producing seed, and they are not going to go over the winter, and they're going to drop out of the composition position. Again, another factor, optimizing light to the seedlings, cutting off annual uh, weed seed, seed heads by that mowing thing. Another item to stack the deck in favor of the meadow plant. So first year, mowing every seed, you end up mowing it about four times during the season, mowing the tops. Year two, you start getting early stage species, and year two, Biennials, uh, dotting in the foreground, the black eyed Susan behind it, and then the field turns into a more uh, uh, permanent composition once those species dropped out and are replaced by the longer living perennials. You can supplement with live plants, um, <clears throat> which can allow you to get some of the species in more quickly, uh, particularly some that are very, very slow growing, like that uh, 
way from spike flower boulders I showed you in seven, eight years, maybe more. Um, you know, you can plant some patches of live plants that you have in there more quickly. Uh, that red bee bomb, which I showed you already, you can't, that plant does not produce much viable seed. It grows by expanding underground roots. You can't even buy seed from it. So if you want that plant in there, it is a good positive plant. Um, uh, you got those live plants. Uh, and uh, Carolina blue pine plant and live plant. Um, I showed, you know, spraying. And there's a lot of, could be, obviously we can take this whole thing and talk about herbicides. Um, but uh, this is an organic installation uh, where the existing weedy vegetation is killed with black plastic. We lay one there for one season. Um, and here's the planting, second year, because the black eyed Susan is blooming and it's biennial. And there's a patch in the center that was uh, left because it was native sedges that were growing in there. It wasn't weeds. So uh, when we put the plastic down to kill the weeds, we did not kill that fish. Now, that plastic came up, uh, it was approximately an acre, and went down in the next acre, phase two. Um, another organic installation, uh, except without killing the turf. These were the slopes going along the driveway, mountain may again. Um, slopes going up the driveway, uh, new house construction, uh, when we came in, there was sod on the slopes uh, or turf, uh, and we needed to convert it to metal. Uh, we could not spray it, because mine did not want to use any herbicides. And we also could not skim the sod off, which was practical. From a scale standpoint, it wasn't that big, we could have done that. But they did not want to open up to erosion. Uh, they had had issues in the construction of the house, evidently, with some bad, uh, they got sighted for stuff. They were not willing to expose the soil. Now, if you just put seeds into living turf grass, turf grass is way ahead, the seeds won't germinate. And as I said, native meadows do well with turf grass. Even if you plant them together with seed, it's certainly not going to overtake existing turf grass. So what we got to do here, we can't remove the turf grass, we can't just seed and thrive in turf grass. We've got to hit the grass turf with everything we can that's not an inorganic chemical. Um, to make it unhappy and weak enough that there's enough space and light that we can seed into it. So how are we going to do that? First of all, we sprayed it with an organic vinegar-based herbicide a number of times to denude it. That won't kill it, but it weakens it. Second of all, we added sulfur to the soil, which is the opposite of lime, brings the pH up and makes more nutrients available to soil. Dropping the pH with sulfur makes less nutrients available to soil. Turf grass, as you know, loves fertilizer. Native meadow species in upland conditions tolerate a great deal of infertility. So uh, that was uh, uh, strategy number two. Now we've got the grass thin. Now we seed into it, there's some space. Now the last strategy is a management strategy where we're gonna mow aggressively that meadow, not only the first year, like I said, but in the spring for a few subsequent years, but only in the spring. Why? Turf grass grows in the spring, not in the summer. Native grass and many of the native warm season flowers grow in the summer and not so much in the spring. So if we mow the rest of the spring, we're only cutting turf. If we stop mowing at the end of spring, turf isn't coming back much because it's out of its season. The native meadow plants thrive in the heat, they come up. So if you're doing that for a number of years, you're favoring the meadow species over the turf. And we end up with a native meadow for the longer time, but we avoided the use of chemicals. And it's all about understanding the life cycles and proclivities of what we're managing against, which was what we're managing for, which is native meadow species. And because we're managing against a cool season grass, we want to exclude cool season plants from our seed mix. Because any management that's going to hurt the grass is going to hurt those cool season plants too. So there's a lot of strategizing going on here, especially in that situation. So uh, management, I'll finish up very quickly. After the first year of mowing, which is cutting uh, over the top five, six inches, uh, once every approximately six weeks, the meadow would be mowed once a year. Uh, primarily at the end of winter, leave the stalks up over winter, just mow it late winter, early spring, before things come up with a brush on. Um, so you can see a little blue stem, native grass being mowed. Or instead of mowing, you can burn. And burning is large, uh, uh, often considered by ecologists to be very favorable to the native meadow species disfavorable to most weeds. Uh, so burn or mow, uh, late winter or early spring. There's a mowed uh, burn field. The pensum and white flower was there before we burned, but the uh, uh, tradescans of blue flower took off after we burned. Uh, 
burning will favor native grasses. If you want native grasses, burning will definitely uh, <coughs> favor them. Um, these are native grasses that uh, were never planted. This is, I'll, I'll kind of finish with this because it's interesting. Um, these, these grasses uh, were never, were not planted. It's in Harrisburg, Pennsylvania area. Uh, and it's the largest non-planted native grassland, uh, I believe, in the East Coast. And it uh, is almost weed-free. Uh, this doesn't exist, where you have native grasses. There's many rare species in there. Uh, uh, botanists come to study this place. And you know what it is? It's uh, 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 a National Guard training facility where they do farming, practice farming. And it burns all the time. And it's like incredibly botanically rich because they bomb it and it burns. Main impact area. There's carnivorous plants that will eat you. That's what you know, there's bombs that could fall on your head. And tanks running around where the room. Um, I'll tell you this one story to kind of end this thing. Um, I think there's two slides after it just shows spots rain. But um, uh, there's a rare violet on this property that hosts a very rare butterfly. I think it's a legal thrill. I don't want to say the name, I always forget. Uh, a very rare butterfly, extremely rare, is on this property. Um, and the reason it's there is the violets that are growing there that this butterfly requires is growing in tank tracks where they do maneuvers. That's the only place it's grown. And the EPA came in, I don't even know if the DEP came in and said, you can't be bombing and running tanks around in here anymore because you have this rare butterfly. Except the butterfly was only there because of the violet, and the violet was only there in the tank tracks. And there was actually a court case between the, a botanist who is employed by the National Guard, uh, who, who is advising them on the site uh, 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 against the state, uh, and they won. And they're still bombing and running tanks. <laughs> so what do you need to do a meadow is a, uh, a brush hog and a uh, beef bed of bomber. You know? <laughs> yeah, you know, that, that's, I don't think this will become commonplace in backyards in, uh, you know, any time in the future. I can imagine two, two people arguing, uh, talking over the, over the backyard fence, you know, hey, you're, Joe, your yard's getting a little weedy. You say, yeah, well, the guy was supposed to carpet bomb last week, but he didn't show up. <laughs> It's going to be in two weeks, but I'll believe when I hear the sign. Um, anyway, there's a bomber. And the last thing I'll show here is controlling weeds. The plants do the majority of the work if you've done your job right, but it will never do 100%. So a meadow, the management is mowed once a year and twice, three times if you're being fastidious, control and spot control weeds, which is generally spot application of herbicide which you doing there, and this is a very safe way to do it. That's a thistle plant, that's a, a wick applicator. That tube is hollow, it's got herbicide in it. Uh, the, it's like a pink roller that's just uh, uh, absorbing the material, and you just brush up and down the plant, so there's no spray, there's no drip, there's nothing dropping on the soil, and I think it's a very environmental way to apply uh, herbicide to individual weed. And the majority <coughs> is native plants, but if that thistle is not treated, It'll get bigger next year, bigger next year, and then there it is. Uh, so I'll, I'll leave it there. I think we're, we're out of time, correct? Oh. Okay, well, I'll just show you the last couple things. Pathways are open. There's a way to get in there and see what's going on. And this is the last kind of uh, uh, idea here, which is getting a little bit beyond meadows. Planting meadows is going to provide uh, a really important uh, food source for uh, uh, bees that does not exist in any significant amount uh, in our landscape, uh, except where we're planting them. Uh, so it's a really important thing to do. But not only the diversity of plants is important for bees, to get that diversity of plants, not only have the maximum diversity within uh, a meadow, but have the maximum type of habitats. So that the forest has diversity, and the edges have diversity, and the shrubs have diversity. So here's a meadow. And I'm putting it in a uh, larger ecolo uh, 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 ecological mix. And much of what you're seeing is plant was planted. Um, so there's a lot of different diversity of habitats there, not just the meadow. Shrub thicket.
exploitation. Uh, here you can see, I'll, I'll pick up the back, um, where you've got on the left the trees, uh, then the shrub stage coming in, and then on the other side of the path, the meadow. And each of those has diverse species that are different from the other. So that's an uh, optimal situation. So thank you very much. I'm happy to take questions. Thank you.